All right, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, unit testing and UI testing your React applications using uh, Enzyme and Jest. So to start this off, uh, who am I? My name is Ryan Walsh. I work for OC Tanner up in Salt Lake City. They're not just a jewelry store. Um, I was a lead instructor at Dev Mountain, so you know I like the sound of my own voice and I can just go on and on. And uh, I am a code quality lunatic. And some people, they, they ask me, what, what does that mean? What do you mean by lunatic? And I like to refer them to this, this old tweet, that you should always write code as if the maintenance programmer were an axe murderer who knows where you live. And that's an old picture. I had hair for that. But yeah, I just, anything to do with testing, linting, keeping code up to date and easy to develop, that's what I love to talk about. That's like what I love to get involved with. Oh, we're back. All right, so this is a question. I imagine most of us are hopefully already unit testing. Hopefully you have your own reasons for why you want to unit test. But let's just go over some good, uh, some good basics here. So greater confidence when changing code. This is probably the biggest one that most people feel all the time. You can go in, you can make a change to that function and you run your unit tests and you can be like 75% sure you haven't just ruined everything. And that's a good feeling, except for when it's the 25%. Uh, it let's you catch regression. So when you do break something, you know exactly what you broke. You don't have to go digging through your code and try and find what broke because you're gonna have a unit test that's waving its hands, it's saying, hey, you broke me. It's me you broke. This one doesn't get talked about as much, but it's super important. Easily testable code is usually better code. It's easier to read and it's easier to maintain. And so the reason this is, is because what's, what's easier to test? One function that does 700 different things or 700 functions that each do one thing? It's the 700 functions, right? Because trying to track every side effect and every little intricacy of that one enormous function is going to be a huge pain. So unit testing, eventually you're going to find yourself, you're going to realize, oh wow, this, this function is getting really hard to unit test. Maybe I should refactor the function. Hopefully you think that and not maybe I should just skip unit testing this one. And then this one gets looked over a lot. But it's one I love. Every change has to be intentional, which means if you go through and you make a change in your code, you're going to see a breaking unit test and you're going to have to go fix that unit test, which means you can't just accidentally change something and say, oh, well, it works. You actually have to consciously go into those tests and say, no, this is what I wanted. This is the expected behavior. And that gets overlooked a lot. And then, of course, bragging rights. Everybody wants to be able to walk into the room and say, yeah, we've got 100% code coverage. I don't have 100% code coverage, but I'm working on it, and you should be working on it too. Uh, there is something that's important to remember, something that's really important to remember when you're unit testing, and that is that unit testing is not everything, but it does help. You should still have your end-to-end -end tests. You still need QA. You still need all that other stuff. Unit testing is more about developer happiness and being confident in your own code than trying to take over for QA or, or not needing to write those end-to-end -end tests. You unit test for yourself. All right, so now that we know why we're testing, why Enzyme specifically? For those of you that don't know, Enzyme is a library. It was written by uh, Airbnb. It's open sourced and uh, it's what we're going to be focusing on here. And so it's a higher level abstraction over React's test utilities, which means you can do all of this stuff with React by itself. You don't need Enzyme. All that stuff is already out there. But it's not going to be very fun. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have to deal with their poorly documented stuff, and you're going to be digging into their source code, and you're going to be running into all sorts of strange issues. And for those reasons, it is officially recommended by the React team. They don't want you to use their raw test utilities. They want you to use the wrapper that someone else has built. They've recognized that it's an improvement. Uh, really good docs, and that's super important. As developers know, having good docs, 
saves you hours and hours of pain and heartache and digging through source code. Uh, all the cool kids are doing it. And this is not just, a, uh, not just a joke, because it means there's a rich ecosystem around it. It's not one of those libraries where you're going to run into a problem and you're going to find the one stack overflow question that was asked two years ago and never got any answers and just wonder what happened to that poor person. <laughs> and then you'll look at the name and you'll realize that that poor person was yourself two years ago. And it's, it's going to make your life easier. That's, that's the biggest thing. That's what's really important here is we all want to make our lives easier. We don't want to spend a huge amount of time giving ourselves unnecessary work. So when we're looking at a, uh, a React component, this is a little functional to-do component from a to-do list. We want to look at this and we want to decide what, what should we test? What from here is worth writing unit tests for? And my answer to that is anything that's not static, things that are going to change. So when I say anything that's not static, I mean this stuff. We've got a class name that depends on whether or not the to-do has been completed. We've got a controlled checkbox. We have a toggle completion handler. We've got some text. We've got all this stuff we're getting through props that we want to make sure our component takes in and does what it's supposed to with it. So let's set up our test file here. We're going to have to import a few things. We're going to import React. We're going to import to JSON, which we'll talk about a little later. And then we're going to bring in this shallow render from Enzyme. And we're going to set up our import and our describe. So what, what are these? Why do I need them? What are they doing? Uh, React, anywhere you use JSX, you have to import React. So we're going to be using JSX in our test files. So we need React there. Uh, to JSON, we're going to get into a later in the talk. And it's just to help set up snapshots, which we'll talk about a little later. And then shallow, this is the important part. The shallow method that we've imported from Enzyme is, uh, is what we're going to be using to render our component. They're going to render this fake component just as a JavaScript object, essentially, to give us an idea of what the output is like and give us access to that component. So let's start here. We're going to start by making sure this component renders the text we expect it to render. So the first thing we have to do is to render the component. We're going to create a variable, and we're going to store the result of this shallow render method in that variable. And you're going to notice I'm, I'm passing all the props here, even though all I'm checking is props.text. And so the reason I'm doing this, this is something I'm going to come back to a few times, is Enzyme has a very holistic approach to unit testing. You want to make the test environment as realistic as possible in comparison to the actual environment the code's going to be running in. So even though we're not checking anything to do with whether it's complete or either of these no-op functions we have in here, we want to pass them in anyway, just in case there's some weird interaction that we wouldn't catch if we just ignored them. And so we're just going to find that element. We're going to say, OK, I want to find an element with the class of dot to do underscore info. And I want it to have the text of test to do, which is the te text that we passed in uh, up in props. And so dot find should be very familiar in its usage. If you've ever used a query selector or if you've ever used jQuery or any of those other libraries, you can pass in any number of things. You can pass in anything that's valid for a query selector, like class names or IDs. You can pass in a component name if you have a child component. Um, yeah. All right. And then if you're paranoid like me and you want to make sure that the text actually changes, you can change the props and check again. So we're going to say, OK, we're going to set the new props. We're going to pass in new text. And it is going to update. All right. So that's pretty simple so far. We're just checking that props are passing through correctly. We're handling them correctly. What about user interaction? Because that's really what makes a web app a web app. 
So what is user interaction at its core? User interaction is an event handled by a function. Somebody clicked a thing, they pressed a key, they moved the mouse, they did a thing. Somebody did a thing, and we have a function waiting for them to do that thing. So let's test some user interaction here. We have an on change handler. So our on change handler, we expect it to update some, something somewhere. We expect it to call this function when somebody changes the value of this input. So again, we're going to set up our shallow rendered component. And you'll notice that I'm doing a new one here. And I set up a new one in every single uh, it block because, and this is more applica applicable to stateful components, but because you don't want to have some artifact from the previous test come in and mess you up here. If you have state, you might have adjusted state in the last test, and if you're still using the same shallow rendered component, you're going to run into issues because the state's not going to be what you expect it to be. Uh, up at the top, I'm also creating a spy. For anybody who's not familiar with spies, it's basically a fake function that lets you track metrics. You track what the function's doing and when it gets called, arguments, all that good stuff. Then we need to simulate that event. We need to tell Enzyme, hey, there's been an event, a user interacted, they did that thing. So we're going to say dot simulate change, and then we're going to check and make sure that the user interacted and that our spy was called. The function called its props dot tog or uh, props dot uh, yeah toggle completion when it was supposed to. Okay, so it's it's been pretty pretty easy so far. It follows kind of an intuitive path, hopefully. And uh, what about stateful components? Because stateless components are generally a lot easier to work with and reason about and then you run into stateful components where you have all the different possible states and things are changing and it's a mess. So what about testing those? So we have another component here. We have our new to do where we have an input where somebody can input some text and they can create their new to do's. And we can see where we've mapped these functions where we're changing state to different points on the, uh, in the markdown or the markup. All right, so we will check handle change again, but now with our input and updating state. So first off, again, we're rendering, we're passing props. And so we could, if we wanted to, get in there and test that handle change method directly. We can go and we can say, I want to get into the instance of this. I want to be able to access all the properties and all the methods that are living on the instance of this class and I want to explicitly call handle change. So we could do that, and it would work. This test would pass. But we don't want to do that. And this comes back to trying to maintain as realistic of an environment as possible. So we're testing the method. We're testing that the function itself works, but we're not testing that the implementation works. We're not testing that the connection between adding that change handler in the JSX and the function. We're not testing the connection. And we want to do that. We want to make it as realistic and analogous to our actual environment as possible. So we're going to update it. We're going to find that input, and we're going to simulate change, just like we did in the previous one. And now we're going to pass an object. So because we're doing all of this stuff just in JavaScript, there's no DOM firing off events, we're going to pass it this object. And this is the fake event. We're making our own event here. We're going to say, OK, we're going to have an event. It's got a target. The target has a value. And the value is what we're looking at. It's what the component expected. If we go back here, it looks for event.target.value. All right, and then again, we just say, OK, we need to check the state, which we get by grabbing new to do.state. And we can grab access everything in there, and we check that it is the expected value. All right, next up, we're going to check our submit to do. This is a little more complex. It does a few more things. 
It needs to prevent default or else the page is going to reload. It needs to call the submit method passed in through props, and it needs to reset state back to an empty string. So we could unit test it like this. But there's a few things wrong with this test. This test is not ideal. It's, it's not how you want it to be. So what's wrong with it? So first off, it's doing too much. It's, it's not a unit test anymore. It's no longer testing a unit. It's testing three different things all at once. And we don't want it to do that. We don't want it to do that because when the test fails, we won't know which of those three things caused the test to fail unless we actually get in there and poke around and find out. So it's doing too much. We are explicitly setting state. We're calling the set state method and we're altering things. And because that's not what a user would be doing, that's not how a user is going to interact with your page, it's recommended you don't do that. It's not forbidden, it's allowed. And, and it's, it's something you're going to do semi-frequently when, when you have to test really hard to get to states. You know, if it takes like six interactions to get to the state you want to test, then in that case you're probably better off this way. But in general, you want to lean towards simulating it as realistically as possible. So let's, let's update this. Let's break it down into three new tests. First one, we want to make sure it calls props.submit. So we're going to set up our spy, just like we did in the past. We're going to shallow render that component. We're going to find the form, and we are going to sim simulate a, uh, a change. So we're going to get to that state where there's actually input on state. And then we're going to find the form and we're going to call the submit method on that. We're going to simulate the submit method on that. And finally, we're going to check that our props, our uh, props.submit has been called with what we expected it to be called with. So now we're, we've broken that out into one test and we're following a more natural flow. The next test, we need to make sure it clears state because that's something that method does. We need to make sure it resets it back to an empty string. So we're going to do the exact same thing we did in the last test. We're going to render our component. We're going to give it some input. We're going to fake a submit. And then we're going to check state and make sure that's what we expect it to be. All right. And then we need to check, does it call prevent default? Otherwise, our page is going to be reloading. So again, follow the exact same steps as that first one. Just this time, we're now uh, passing in our spy as the prevent default handler to our submit to make sure that gets called. So we've broken it up, and we've, we've made a little bit of extra work for ourselves in that we're writing more code. But in the long run, it's going to pay off, because when this code inevitably breaks, it'll be easier to fix. All right, so this is pretty cool. And uh, we want to we wanna get into some UI testing. Because right now we're mostly testing that the functionality on the components is there. What if I want to pr prevent these UI, um, UI bugs, UI issues where things are not rendering as you would expect them to render? So here we have our list component, I believe. Yeah, we have our list. This is where we're rendering all of the to-dos that a uh, user has created. And we have some to-dos here. We're mapping over state and we're creating these to-do elements. And we need to test that and make sure it's working. And so the way I would do this is I would set up this list and I'm going to call set state. And the reason I'm calling set state here manually is because to get those to-dos on state, I would have to render all the child components and mess with that stuff, and it's not worth the hassle. And that's your call to make as a developer. So we're going to put those on, and we're going to say, expect to JSON this component to match snapshot. And so that's, that's really succinct. That's, how is that, how is that even testing things? What, what is to match snapshot? You're not making any real assertion, right? So, so what is a snapshot? This is a snapshot. 
It's a string. That's all it is. It's a string with some kind of React looking stuff in it. So this is what our component looks like. This is what that two JSON library has turned our JavaScript enzyme rendered component into. And so we have this reference of what it's supposed to look like. And you might be saying, okay, what, why is this string so awesome? You still haven't tested anything. You haven't made a, an assertion yet. What is so good about this? So you don't have to write these exhaustive checks, checks where you're testing links and class names and all that other stuff. Anybody who's worked with Enzyme before trying snapshots knows that there were many, many tests of where you're finding a list of elements and checking the length of that list. And you're finding the class and checking it and then changing props and checking the class again. And that was a hassle. That was a huge hassle. And by bringing Jest and snapshots into our code base, uh, I think pretty much every file that gets touched, every test file that gets touched, 40 to 60% of the existing tests just get deleted and replaced with expect to match snapshot. It's, it's big. <laughs> so this one's good too. There's no need to rewrite tests for every, UI, every minor UI change. You can just update the snapshot. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. But you no longer have to go in and say, okay, we changed this class name by like three characters, so I have to update 17 tests that use that class name. Git diffs are much more clear and concise for UI changes. If you're looking at tests, it's not super easy when you're doing a, a, a code review to see what changed and to make sure that the tests are covering the new change. And when you're working with snapshots, you actually have what the layout looks like right there in that string. And you can compare the previous version to the new version. So it's a lot easier for the reviewer. And lastly, it took, it took zero effort to implement. We imported to JSON, and then we used the tools we were already using. We just said, expect this thing to match the snapshot. OK, cool. Hopefully, you're all as sold as I am right now, and you're going to go to your work and start using snapshots. And I don't, I don't work for Jess. They don't pay me to say this. I just love them that much. So how, how are we going to use them? We're going to start off by making a mistake here. So this to-dos with the arrow is supposed to be wrapped in brackets because it's referencing that variable up top. So here's what Jest is going to spit out for us. It's going to say, hey, I was expecting this stuff, and instead I got the word to-dos, which is not what I wanted. And this bottom line, I don't know if you guys can read it, but it basically says, hey, a snapshot test failed. If this is what you expected, if the changes are what you want, press U and we'll fix it and we won't warn you again. We'll just update the snapshot. Yep. It's nice. All you have to do is press U, Jest is going to update it, and you move on with your life. So let's say I'm OK with this change because I don't pay attention to my test runner. And I go ahead and commit, and I push everything to GitHub. So I'm going to put in my pull request. I put in my pull request. And because I'm the best coder, there are no bugs. And I get my company mandated code review. And I am informed that I've made a mistake. I am informed kindly and concisely that I have an error in my code. So I can now go in, I can say, oh, that was simple. I forgot the brackets. We found the bug, and we fixed the bug. OK. So these, these tools are really cool, and I want to use them. But just how much time is it going to take me to set all of this stuff up and get it working? And how many hours am I going to spend in my Webpack config trying to make sure it works with my code base? Not many. So here are all of the dependencies you're going to need to cover most of your use cases. Jest, which is our test runner. Enzyme, which is our test renderer. Enzyme to JSON. This is the library that we're using to convert Enzyme's output into something that snapshots can read. Then we have uh, these two last ones. They're React's built-in test stuff. 
and the enzyme requires these. So you have to have these installed to be able to use enzyme. And lastly, we have JSDOM. This is not technically mandatory. Every test we've ran through here so far would work totally fine without JSDOM. But chances are, at some point, you're going to need JSDOM. At some point, your tests are going to get complex enough that you're going to need to stick it in there. So I included it just in case. So let's talk about how much stuff you need in your Jest config. This is, this is all good stuff. And some of it's stuff you might need, but none of it is mandatory. None of it is mandatory. So you don't actually need any Jest config. But you'll probably want a few of these things. So the top level, that's for counting code coverage. It'll spit out a nice little box that tells you, hey, you have 75% code coverage. Here are the lines you're missing. You forgot to check the other side of this if else. The ones in the middle here, you need these if you're importing styles or you're importing files into your JavaScript. So if you're using like CSS modules or you're importing your images and processing those via Webpack, anything like that, you're going to need this. You need to tell Jest, hey, don't, don't go looking for those actual files because you won't know what to do with them. I'm going to send you to these files instead. Just go there instead and don't worry about it. And then the last one, we're just pointing it towards where our JS DOM setup lives. We're going to say, hey, we need JS DOM setup. Go grab this file and run it for us and keep it in the test context. All right. And so these are very small files. Our file mock, just a string. That's all it needs to be because we don't care what's in the actual file. We just want it to not break when Jest imports it. Our style mock, empty object, because if you're using CSS modules, you're probably requiring them into your JSX, and then you're saying, you know, my CSS.header or my CSS.footer, and this is just the stand-in. All right. And lastly, this is the biggest one we've got. It is our setup.js file for JS DOM. And uh, I'll walk you through what this does. But honestly, Google JS DOM config, copy and paste, and you're good to go. That's what I did. That's where this came from. So JS DOM is just a library that allows you to run uh, a headless browser, essentially. And so you just need to configure it for when you want to do more in-depth browser things. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. And so here we're just going to create a new document. We're going to make it available globally. We're going to find properties that are missing that we need to have for that document and put them there. And we're going to set up our user agent because we're running our tests here. Um, so the, the places where you would use JS DOM is when you need to use one of Enzyme's other test renders. So this whole time we've been using Shallow. And Shallow is what you should aim for. It's what you should use most of the time. They have two other test renders. One is called uh, Render, I believe. It's the one I never use. And there's one called Mount. And Mount is what you're going to need JS DOM for. Mount is going to render the component you pass it. And then it's going to render its child components, and it's going to render all those child components, and it's going to go very, very deep, and it's, it's going to be slower, and it's going to be cause more issues. Cool. So mount is when you need to test some interaction between the parent component and the child component. And it's something I don't run into very often, so hopefully you don't end up needing this stuff as well. So, in summary, we primarily want to test things that are not static. Or that, yeah, that are not static. And I say primarily because anything that is static, ideally we're testing with these Jest snapshots. And that's going to make our lives easier. And then everything that can change, everything that users interacting with and sending off functions, we'll test those with Enzyme. We want to test the implementation as realistically as possible. If a user is going to get to this state by pressing a button, then typing in some text, then pressing another button, then let's simulate those events and make sure everything hooks up 
in the way it's expected to. Enzyme and snapshots aren't at all mutually exclusive, and they really make a powerful pair. Snapshots take away all those major pain points that enzyme can bring along with it. Snapshots are great for catching UI regressions. And those, uh, those are super frequent in, in my case. Maybe I'm just a bad developer, but they help me catch when I'm a bad developer so nobody else gets to see how bad of a developer I am. All right, and as I wrap up here, I want to have some nice blatant self-promotion. Uh, it's a project I've been working on for off and on for about a month, and it ties in with this talk. And I've got great animations. So coming soon to a package manager near you, just dashboard. And if you've ever used Webpack dashboard, anybody use Webpack dashboard? I mostly just stole the idea from them and most of the markup. So ideally, it's just a, uh, it's a more clean layout for all of your Jest output. And so I was hoping to have this out like a month ago, ran into an interesting issue, but hopefully it'll be out soon. Keep an eye out. Try Webpack Dashboard if you haven't. It's awesome. All right, so that's all I've got. Um, I've got five minutes, five minutes for Q&A if anybody has questions. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be very similar because, uh, both of these tools are very much focused on the, uh, UI testing. So with Redux, you're just going to need to pass in those fake props that Redux would be ha ha handing it. So it should be, should be very similar to this. I would probably snapshot that. I wanted to include that test just so I could get into the basics of enzyme stuff. But yeah, I would probably snapshot that. Yeah. 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 They're they're very similar. Um, I don't remember the exact API for it, but I know it's all there. And I actually, I prefer Sign-On's API, though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm using uh, Fira Code is the name of the font, F-I-R-A Code. And uh, it's got something called Font Ligatures, which are awesome. They do, let me see if I can get to... Yeah, so they give you stuff like the triple equals all blending together and the arrows connecting. And some people hate it. I love it. Hopefully it didn't make any of my code hard to read today. F-I-R-A. Yes, F-I-R-A. All right. Any other questions? So um, Jest is pretty performant in my experience. Um, the current code base I'm working on is around 700 unit tests, and we're running them in about in about a minute. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. So, which which part specifically, the snapshots or the enzyme portion, or all of it in general? So, enzyme is 
primarily for React. You might be able to use it for other very similar frameworks like Preact. Um, snapshots, you can actually snapshot anything. You can snapshot like an add methods outcome and it'll just be four, you know, if you put in two plus two. So you can snapshot anything. You just have to make it JSON serializable. Anybody else? Yeah. So the reason I would do it, and the reason I do do it, is because it gives me more confidence in changes. I'm, I'm more confident in the code I'm pushing to QA and pushing to prod. Um, like I said, you definitely still want to have end-to-end -end tests. Um, but I, I would be uncomfortable working in a, in a test base that wasn't at least making an effort to unit test their, uh, their components. Oh, so not, not the UI? Yeah. Oh, well for the UI, I, uh, I think the trade-off is small enough that with, with snapshots that it doesn't cost much extra to include those. Yeah, yeah. Do you have Twitter? Yes, uh, I thought it was on this slide, but it's not. It's at underscore RT Walsh. All right, how much? I got time. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Like, you, you, could, you could render something based on internal state. Mm -hmm. If you were checking against internal state at the same time, you could check against the outside of that. So, so ideally, I would check against, uh, I would check manually against the internal state instead of just checking the output when it's a state that might not be rendered within that component. So like the list component stores a bunch of stuff on state, but it's not going to render some of its child components. And so if I need to get in there and check that list state to make sure it's working, I'm not able to do that via the UI testing or the snapshot testing unless, uh, unless I actually do a full mount and render all those child components as well. Yeah. Yeah, my experience with Enzyme is that it, that it is fragile because it's, I mean, you're working with the UI, which is changing constantly, and so you just have to keep it up to date. It's, Enzyme is definitely fragile. Uh, snapshots are fragile, but they're super easy to fix. You just confirm that it's what you want, you press update, it updates, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm sure sometimes that's right answer, but um, Helper, um, I feel like framework actually allows you to provide different versions of Helper, which helps you identify which version is going in the Okay. Uh, Jest, I believe, does. I haven't used that. Um, so you probably could test it all in one place. Me, personally, I would still avoid testing it all in one function just because I like to keep my unit tests very, very separated and isolated. But I, I believe so, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. 
So you're going to update it locally, and you're going to keep them committed to GitHub, and you turn it into part of your, uh, your code review process. And so when you merge those snapshots in, other developers are going to see those changes, they're going to review those changes, and they're going to pull the, they're going to pull the changes down, and they'll have them locally as well. And so the server is going to have uh, the snapshots you have on GitHub, presumably. It doesn't, it's not going to be storing its own snapshots. Uh, one thing I will note, though, uh, dates. Dates are painful in snapshots, especially when your CI is on UTC and you're running your tests in Utah time. Dates are going to break, and then you're going to spend a long time trying to figure out how to mock dates in Jest, which was last week for me. Time check. Okay, if anybody else has any more questions, I'll be right out through those back doors there. I'm going to close it up here. Thank you.